Hey everybody, it is Cinnamon Cooney, your archer butt, and this is a wet bear step-by-step -step in acrylic on canvas painting. If you've ever wanted to know how to paint a bear uh, kind of bathing in a lake with glittering and reflective water, this class is for you. I'm going to break it down step-by-step, -step, explain every color mix, every technique. Not only that, if you check the description below, you'll see materials and everything listed out, but you'll see a link to the website. If you go to the Art Sherpa official, you'll find a bunch of extra resources for beginners that are free. You'll find an, uh, an option to not have to draw mm -hmm. uh, that is a traceable. On the mic is my husband, John. Hello. He's another one of your resources that is also free. He's going to make sure that you can see every part of this lesson by zooming into the action and, and making sure you can see the bristles of the brush going. Um, this lesson is time stamped and chapter marked, which means you can break down where you are in the progress of it. It comes with a mini book of written out instructions. John, can you believe the mini book thing? I know. I love the mini book thing. <sighs> that makes it so amazing. So even if I turn my canvas maybe a direction, you're like, I'm not really sure what she was doing there. Or if you needed to go back over and what were the colors and just that step, that breaks it down into that and reminds you what the techniques were, plus gives you a photograph of the step. During this video, you're going to see a step-by-step -step demarcation where it's going to show you the step you're on plus the finished uh, image if you don't have a way to print or download. But really, all those resources are on theartsherpa.com. This is part of a 30-day painting program to teach people how to paint water better. But you can do this if you just want to paint a bear. If you're just like, that's a really cute bear, and I paint that bear, this will be a great lesson for you. If you're here because you're like, oh, yeah, I decided to do acrylic April, and now I am this far in. <laughs> To that journey and you're working on this each day of acrylic april teaches a, a skill set about water that builds on the previous day and helps you get to the next day so that by the end of the month you are much better at painting water in landscape in fact this year 2021 is called a story of water this is a yearly challenge that i do it's completely free you don't have to do anything to sign up or anything you can just go back to the beginning and even though we call it acrylic april and john will Mimic that you can do this anytime. Mm -hmm. And while we call it a daily painting, I encourage you to paint a little bit every day. You can break these paintings up into uh, different segments because this is a big, ambitious year. And so if it's it's if it's okay for acrylic to go into May, <laughs> or just take as long as you need to complete the projects. I would more prefer that you complete the projects to learn the skills, like how to make a glittering bear in water then stress about like any construct make this program your own i feel like i've told everybody everything i could did I tell them everything i could tell i think so you feel informed i hope you feel informed um grab your paint get your brushes come back and meet me at the easel because i'm going to show you how to paint this bear bathing in a lake so for the materials on today's lesson, I have an eight by eight surface as we have been doing each day in April. This is an eight by eight stretch canvas. I have a wish on it that says find harmony in the modern in modern life with the world that we live in. And that's just basically like some way in the wish that we all can live our modern lives, but that it is not negatively impactful on our world. I feel like there has to be like a sweet spot there. For the paint colors today, I have Thalo blue, thalo green, ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, cad yellow medium, cad red medium, Mars black, titanium white. You know, and remember, you can check the descriptions below. You can also download the mini book and get the resources off of the Art Sherpa website. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe if you think that free art lessons are cool every day. Don't you agree, John? Mm -hmm. Yes, because we will continue to teach you how to paint water and landscape every day. Today is a bear. And guess what? Bear. I think if you know what we're using, you know where your materials are in the description below and on the website. And if you're ready to get going, I say let's get our, just jump in and go to step one. Rawr! So now we're ready to get, I don't think bears rawr. But let's pretend they're rawr. <laughs> Bears definitely rawr. Do they go rawr? I think more they're more like ah. They do that weird sideways open mouth. I don't know. I don't. I only observe bears from a great distance. <laughs> I am not trying to get close to the bear, but from the nature shows, hmm. that's what I'm thinking. But for him to be, let's pretend this is Otis, who is a okay. famous bear from a famous fishing hole. 
all other bears in that fishing hole have have numbers, but Otis has a name. So we're going to pretend this is Otis the Great Bear, and he is there for his great salmon fishing. The watercolor for that tends to be a teal. And the best way to get to this teal is the ultramarine blue and the phthalo green. So I'm going to do an entire color ground. That just means a solid feel of color on this painting. And then in the next step, we'll do the, I'll show you guys how to use a traceable, but you could use a grid, a projection, a traceable or freehand. It really is up to you. There's descriptions on how to do all of it in the mini book. So even if you don't know how to do it, there's a video for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a mini book for that. There is everything for that. To get this teal going for his great uh, salmon type of water, I'm going to just take the phthalo green and ultramarine blue together and paint the whole thing. And it can be messy. Yeah. It can be messy, messy, messy. It There's... seems that these uh, underpaintings can be a little streaky, little... They really can be because if you know that there's layer after layer coming on, you're really just trying to coat the surface and get a solid kind of tone of color. Hmm. Not a wash, as is sometimes recommended, just because under uh, acrylic paint can underbind, and which just means it doesn't stick well to the surface. And for it to bind, it can take a long time for it to cure. Even though Golden figured out it could cure, they were like, in three weeks. <laughs> if you were going to wait three weeks for something to dry, you might as well paint oils. Right. So I assume you, like me, are like, let's get to the business of a painting here. Notice that I am using a number 26 bright. This uh, brush is just a big brush for painting acrylic. I do the back and forth painting only because I am making sure that I have a good coating on the surface of color. Doesn't have to be perfect coating of surface on the of color, just a coating of color. You have a coating of color. It's an even, even coating of color. Coating of and color. paint on your hand. Well, now it's official. You're an artist. <laughs> you start getting paint all over yourself and your pets and unexpected things in your house. You're like, I'm a full blown artist now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to rinse this brush out because I don't want the acrylic paint to sit in it. Again, that's a bright brush. Uh, it happens to be short handled, but just look for something about an inch wide. Um, the specific one is listed in the description below. Now, guess what? We must dry, and then we'll come back and do a traceable. So that would be the next step. This stage of the surface, you really need to somehow uh, get your objects or your main subject onto the canvas. You can do these a lot of different ways. You can freehand that. That just means to look at your reference and sketch in the shape you see. You can use the gridding method where you break it down into one inch squares and just draw what you see in the square. Or you can use the transfer or tracing method. So we're going to use that today. Uh, the product that we're going to use to get the, the transfer is this yellow serral paper. You want it the bright yellow side down. You can reuse these sheets of paper multiples of times. So it is a little pricey, uh, maybe initially, if you have not looked at carbon, not for carbon paper in general, but, you know, sometimes when you see like an art material for the first time, you're like, what is it made of gold? <laughs> so it just depends on uh, where you're at with that. It does, however, make things significantly easier and a roll of serial paper lasts, you know, a very long time. If you reuse paper, it can be more than a year. So then wow. you're like, oh, that's like cheaper than saran wrap or any of that stuff. No, just you got to be using that. I'm also to, to lengthen the use of my serial paper. I'm using a low tack tape. And the image you see here is available to you on the website. There's no extra cost to get it. It's free. If you go to the link in the description below, it'll take you to the website video page. And you'll find all the references there on the right-hand side. No, left-hand side. This side, left-hand side. <laughs> There's a little traceable module. If you click that, we'll download it and you can print it out. Um, I don't particularly have any printing advice because I'm super not technologically savvy. Like, I spent an hour trying to get my scanner to work last night before I even asked John. So, And they're complicated. Um, so he went different... over and clicked one thing and it worked. So I have, I'm still struggling through some feelings on that this morning. How this works is I draw over all the major lines to get the image to transfer from this paper onto the surface below it. Now, I have given you every ripple, major ripple, just in case you were 
having some trouble with that, um, sometimes it can be hard to see the ripple shapes. And if you put those in early, you can get a better water effect. Because right, we're trying to get all the reflection. Because we're still playing Water is a Mirror. That's the game it is today. Mm. Water is a Mirror. If you're here just because you were like, YouTube said, YouTube said. If you're here because YouTube said, this lady teaches art. You seem like a person who wants to learn how to paint in acrylic. And you like bears. And then you thought, yeah, I do like bears. And you clicked it. And suddenly you got sucked into this. And somehow you haven't clicked away. Uh, based on watch time, you're probably still here. <laughs> but if you haven't clicked away... um, you know, tracing is not cheating. Uh, that's actually a uh, art myth that sometimes people buy into. The transfer method is a really old method from before the Renaissance period. It's an old method in art because artists have always had to figure out how to conserve art supplies. And you don't want to work out your sketches on your best paper or materials. Mm -hmm. You want to have some scratch paper to do that. And then when you get it worked out, then you do what's called a cartoon or traceable is what we're calling it now, and um, transfer that image onto the canvas. And what's nice about that is, like, you could do this image several times. So if you love this bear, Otis, we will say, if you love this bear, then you could come back and do him in maybe, like, water that's more reflecting a sunset. Maybe the water was all in yellows and gold. I like this bear a lot. Right. I like him, too. And it probably actually is Otis. Like I say, it, I, I'm like, let's pretend it's Otis, but it probably is because it's a very fat, happy wild bear. So I'm not a like bear person, but I know that they have unique markings. So if you knew how to spot a bear, you'd probably be like, yeah, the oh. cool thing on there, there's a live stream where uh, bears come and eat trout. Um, it's just starting to open back up here in April. Depending on the magic of YouTube when you're watching this, they may be in full uh, trouting or you may, you know, could even be in not trouting. Could be open trout season for the sh for the bears. And so Otis, so all the bears, there's like 900 and something of them and you can get a guidebook that you can buy to know what bear you're looking at. But then the one they call Otis, like it's super obvious. All these bears, tons of bears, bear cubs, bears are just eating salmon, having a blast. And then this giant bear comes up and he's so much bigger than the other bears. <laughs> it's super funny. And every bear's like, well, I'm done. I'll go do something else now. It is Otis's lake. So it'll go from like 30 bears to one big bear. I guess it's good to be the king. The big bear. The big bear. It's good to be the big bear. Good to be the biggest In big bear. bear. <laughs> he looks like submarine bear here. He is. Well, they do this. Uh, one of them I was watching uh, during one of the fishing events. He would go, or she, I, I don't know bear gender. Um, I'm not up on it. But the bear would go under the water and like hunt under the water and come up with fish. <laughs> that seems like the way to do it. Well, well, there's the other bears that sit on the waterfall and just like, get it in my mouth. Ah, in my I mouth. That's the that's the non sports bear way of doing that's, it. That's my way of doing it. Get in my mouth, fish. Ah. <laughs> I'm not going to worry too much about the little markings here because I'll be putting those in as I go. But listen, if you need them all, they're here, and that will help you find your reflections and get maybe a better result uh, with your water. I put that mark there because there's a bit of a reflection on his eye. So if you've done this well, mm -hmm. what will happen is when you remove this. From the surface in theory you will have a yellow line transfer of everything that we did Ooh. in theory let's find out let's find out. a lot of times we do this live and we don't find out till the reveal on the live that's mm -hmm. always super exciting super duper exciting and even so this was a premiere like we weren't even playing around we were like let's premiere it because you know don't follow my paint that's so rude making sure that uh, I have this down here. I'm using a watercolor pencil over here. You can use chalk or watercolor. You just want something that will remove from the canvas with a light dusting of water. Oh, my goodness. So we're going to call this a step. Um, on the step-by-step -step book, I will, uh, you know, try to make this look more um, visible to you uh, as we go. You just, like, but we're going to do the step so it makes sense. Yeah. So step. So 
So as we go on now, we're going to do what's called blocking in. It's a little bit like a color ground in that we're going to start to paint in values and, and tones of color. It may not be the finishing work that we're doing, but it's the beginning structure for that. To do that, I'm going to use my number eight cat's tongue, Archer of a cat's tongue. Now, this is a pointed filbert. Um, it's a little more rounded than many pointed filberts. And so if you couldn't do this, you could do a round or a braid or really a filbert. In most things, you just want to pick the brush that you feel confident in the brush stroke it's going to give you and you feel like you have a lot of control. Because it's through control, like Miss Janet Jackson said, mm -hmm. <laughs> that you have things I learned in the 80s that you have what you need. So just as long as you're in control, you're in a good, good space. All right. So coming forward here, one thing that we can do is I can take a little bit of my ultramarine blue and my burnt sienna and my phthalo green, and that's going to give me the deep value of this cool water. And perhaps I will come here and start to put in some of the deep values. And the shapes that I'm seeing, actually for you guys, you know what I'm thinking? Hmm. I think they'll have an easier time putting in the highlights and then the shadows. Oh, you think so? Yeah. Sometimes um, your brain will have an easier time processing positive spaces over negative spaces. And the highlights will feel to your brain, <coughs> excuse me, like a positive space. So... Let's try that. I think that that might be more fun. So I'm going to take this color and get a little of my phthalo blue into it and some white. So in this, what I did is I have my ultramarine and my phthalo blue and a little bit of the shadow watercolor that I just mixed. And it's really fun to do these highlights because they have a little ring we get to do at the end. Mm. I will go ahead and... Turn my canvas only so yeah. I can have a better angle and see more, like, you know, sometimes better what I'm doing. Fun to get the little colors in there. So they are highlights. They're reflections of the sky, but they'll feel more like that when we do the little rings around them. You got to do rings around the highlights. Little rings. Little rings. This makes that water surface. Look like it's rippling. Mm -hmm. Like he's sitting in it and it's moving. Motion. Yeah, he's moving portions of it. So it's a little bit different than those um, kind of uh, controlled reflections that maybe we've done so far in our water. It's a little more effective. Mm. Oh, something big is moving the water. Oh. And his bigness is really making it happen there. And again, you know, it really depends on your uh, particular style of learning when you're doing things like a reflection or you're trying to decide, am I going to paint the positive space or the negative space? Uh, and the reason that I perceive the reflections as um, more the positive space here mm -hmm. is because they pull forward. Oh, okay. So that's what we're responding to. And here they may actually be easier to get into after we put in the dark color because they're so small. This is sort of an interesting dilemma. When to put in the color, when to put in the reflection. Mm -hmm. You're and kind of putting some top reflections in there. Yeah. Well, things tend to, if they're in one space, they'll be in another space. So they're big enough here that I might, you know, be thoughtful about that. Now I can go back in with that dark color we talked about at the beginning, which was the ultramarine blue, a little burnt sienna, and the phthalo green for that deep color. And you can see it does get a little bit easier to... Oh, yeah. You can see it a little easier. You can see where you're going a little easier. You can do it either way. And people's brains will work uh, differently because we are not copy machines. Mm -hmm. We are organic, therefore kind of messy. And this doesn't mean we won't come back and refine reflections that we've got going. Right. 
you know. Um, right now my paint's a little bit wet, but it's okay at this stage. And you can just kind of see it's a little gallery there. As long as it's going to bind, I don't worry about it. And we're just trying to get that first run of color in. Lots to do in the water, but this is just that beginning thought. That just blocking in of it really starts, It it's important when you start to put the other pieces in so that your mind can relate to it. Yeah, and see how it's constructed. You know, sometimes our brain has a little trouble knowing how something is going to be constructed. I'm going to take this back here a little bit. Now, interestingly, I'm going to add some yellow into it. It's going to change it and a little white. Not much, just kind of making this distant water a little kind of misty green color. And there's a lot of reasons why the water in nature is a particular color. Very often it's a combination of the weather that day so the sky color, mm -hmm. the trees around it, the bottom of what's underneath it, how dirty or murky or churned it is, and also if it's got algae or some type of plant growth. So there's a lot of things that can affect the color of water, which is why when people are like, well, what color should I paint water? It's not really um, a question that you can always just answer mm -hmm. that easily. Coming around him, I'm going to want to take a little bit of my burnt sienna and my Mars black, and we're going to start to work in a little bit of a brown valued reflection, shadow really, because he's casting a little bit of reflection and shadow into the water. So I can start to put that in here, coming along under his little nosums, and it really comes back to the edge here. And like I said, we're blocking in. So this isn't a precision moment in our life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you do want to think about the shapes you see me creating here. I'm trying to create them in sort of a simple way so that, you know, when you're making that home, you're like, oh, that's that's pretty doable to uh, duplicate. You know, you can add a little blue into it just to make it interesting. <laughs> All right. Let's call that a step. And we will actually dry the surface and then come back and um, start to work some more water details, like get a little more thoughtful about it, get into a number four round and be like, I'm painting the water. So as we come back and we start to do the water around the bear, I'm going to break this up into kind of three zones. The water in the distance, we'll call this kind of in some way the background, the water in the middle space, and then the water in the foreground. And there's a couple reasons why I'm breaking that down for you. One is just to make it so it's not overwhelming in its steps and its consumption. But two, because they almost have different color schemes between the three spaces they like literally have a different ripple set and they have a little bit of a different color scheme and so by breaking it into that you can kind of take in what you've got there and get a nice representation and then pull it through the most involved of the rippling will be around the bear so let's go to the background and i'm going to be using a number eight cat's tongue brush and a number four round from the art sherpa line okay I'm going to get back into my distant teal color, mm -hmm. which I do like to get a little of the burnt sienna into it, even though it's quite green. And I'll get my white in there because it's, it's just kind of far away and a little bit murky. I'm actually fairly familiar. I've seen this water a lot in my life. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting to be like, oh, I'm going to paint this now. The murky water. The murky water. Maybe sometimes I'll get a little yellow in there. So you see me dancing in the color schemes that we're doing, but I'll make small adjustments to something based on what it is. I'm kind of trying to create a field 
and I am painting into the lines of my traceable bit. Uh, that's the other reason why tracing is not cheating is because by the time you're done painting, you're painting it in anyways. Like mm -hmm. it's happening. You just, it's just when you do. But when I have that in, I can kind of rinse out this brush because it's better for bigger areas and come in and get into my number four round and I'm going to load up some white and I'll pull a little bit of this color over into my white paint but I want a kind of grayish reflection and we're going to come here and behind his little ear and it makes some little lines. These are dashing. My brush is going to connect and release in the canvas. This is to mimic the way the water is behind him. Because it's in motion. Little ripples. Yeah, it's a river, not a not a pond. He's not in a pond. And there's probably other bears and there's salmon. There's stuff afoot. And that will definitely... You never know. He might have his own private, like, natural Well, if it turns out this spa. is a zoo bear, then yeah, he probably does. If he's well, a zoo bear, is he, he a zoo bear? He could be a zoo there's bear. There's that one panda who has his own little pond, and he just plays with his little feet. Oh, the you saw that video I shared on Twitter. I have a Twitter account. You may <laughs> avoid Twitter, which would be a reasonable thing to do, but my Twitter account is a safe space. And... um. There was this panda in a little, like, I don't know, hot tub or something. And he was like, this, this, it was a panda this, tub. The panda tub. It was a very happy panda, though. But the joy of that animal was extraordinary, I think, is what it was. He should be in the compilation of our least useful studio companions, Panda. <laughs> <laughs> so I the could least share. compatible studio companions. He's <laughs> like, eh. <sighs> Somewhere up there with Buffalo. We'll have to see, like, uh, if we have enough support where we could take a content ID strike. <laughs> uh, you know how the system is. But it would be fun to share those. I imagine goats probably are also not good studio companions. They tend to get into and everything. Dude, don't start with goat people because goat people love goats. Uh, no, I'm saying Goat they're... people love goats and they will tell you that the goat is the best studio companion of any studio companion you've ever had. You can yoga with a goat. You can cook with a goat. You can go on a trip with a goat. As long as you don't mind the goat being on your head while you're doing all those things. <laughs> Sometimes I lift, I <laughs> don't want him on my head. Sometimes I lift the brush, I lift the angle of the brush handle, and I'm just touching and releasing, making even smaller little bits of sort of water that's going on behind him. I can blend this into the larger reflection that I had begun to paint in back here. Every once in a while, it's a good idea to come back and get a little bit lighter. Mm-hmm. Just a few places. It's not everywhere, but light will hit the water. And you will want to uh, get spoken about it. I just. I'm going to come back over to his uh, left side. All right. The scene area that I kind of missed, and I need to make sure that I get this in. Because, of course, he's going on there. So it's a little bit of a grayed version of the green that we were using up front. Mm -hmm. If you're having any trouble mixing colors, please do take advantage of one of my many, many color mixing videos. You have a couple of those. A and few. There's the, a playlist. There's that split color palette one's really good. Yeah, the tin tone shade chart like covers all of it. You can do that with any of the paints that you have. You don't even have to have my exact paints in it. And it really makes a big difference. Again, I might come through and uh, add just some different little values and tones just to make sure that this water here feels as if it's... <sighs> releasing. All right, that was the background water. Now let's do the busy work of this area of water from really uh, here, across here, because there's sort of a ripple in kind of, there's a little zone where it does this. 
where he's impacting what he has going on mm-hmm. and before the big reflection starts. So that's the part we're going to come back and do. I'll see you right back here. Okay, John, guess what water we're involved in? Mm, the blue, the blue water. water. No, this part. This is the most interesting part. It's the most colorful water because it's all around the bear. Oh. So the most that's happening in the painting is the part where light is reflecting off him onto the water and he's making motion. His, even his little breaths and all the funnest reflections. This will be the most involved part of the water that you're dealing with. All I'm right. grabbing a number for a round. And we're going to go through and create some values and some interesting fun stuff. Now... Initially, I'm going to take my ultramarine blue and my thalo blue and get some white into it because that makes a very nice water reflection as well. That sort of mid-tone. And come off here. It's a little brighter than what was back behind us, and that's okay. That's what we want. And I find it's good to kind of make little changey thinking bits where I go with little lines. Mm-hmm. Coming up to him, you know, really leading all the way up to him, it can be any of the blue or any of the stuff because it's behind him. But once you get up to him, it all changes. So I've got to catch the ones that are leading up to him a bit. And so I'm going to come over here to the left-hand side and add some of these. They kind of come in and they're just another level of reflection. What's going on? He's a reflected bear. I don't know what. I'm going to rinse that out. For the water, I want to take some of the brown, right? And then I'm also going to take a little of my yellow and red and make an orange because that's going to be one of the ways that I tone his fur. And then I've got some yellow over here. So we're going to be making lots of little brown and fur colors. Mix up a few so that you're having fun. I might even get some white in there because we're going to be changing and changing and changing. So like right here, you know, I might come put a little of that little uh, burnt sienna, Mars black, and a little cad yellow and white over there. I'm on the toe of my brush. And the big thing is I'm going to be making lots of little wiggled reflections. Perhaps there'll be some over here mm-hmm. where I think I'm going to have colors again and again and again. I will kind of move my brush over into that and then, you know, that way I'm not having to mix it often like this. I might add a little white to it. Often I, I just suddenly became like from Goodwill hunting. <laughs> uh, A little of that here. Sort of super fun. I think it's a really good looking bear. He's like he's gonna be so pretty. And these reflections really are in that space between the two zones where the water starts to uh roll up. Mm-hmm. And you can see already it creates that feeling of when you sort of see it, once you've seen it a couple times, you'll be like, you'll never unsee it. It will always be a little bit, you can see it. And then you'll be like, I'm going to go ahead and add a little of the blue to that just to gray it a bit. Um, Even green it as it comes around this corner. A similar thing, but it's like maybe they're smaller. The shapes that you make, these little wiggles, yeah, help imply uh, water that's rapidly rippling. Hmm. Little micro ripples. Hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Fun to do the micro ripples. I always try to make sure that uh, whatever I've got going on in the water, I have a plan to take it around a couple of places. Hmm. Things are never just one and done. 
That's I'm going to grab a little of my br just brown and some black. Very simple color mix here. These are little spots near him that are really reflecting down Catching. from his fur first. Getting a lot of, yeah, the fur and the reflection. Because he, he would be, like, he, not only does he cast the shadow and darken the water around him, and now maybe some of what's under there could maybe be, like, a little bit showing. But also, he's in the water. So. And we got to make sure that we show him being there a little bit. Hmm. <laughs> And go a little into it like a darker ripple. And it's fun to play with all these ripples, I think. And get like a darker ripple at the nose. The nose has a dark agenda. There's a dark agenda. This little bear nose is sniffing. Sniffing for stuff. Because I guess bears sniff like pig sniff. Like they got good snippers. I'm well. I would. Yeah, that's a. You know, I think lots of animals out there have good noses because they can smell much further than they can see. So it kind of makes sense that they would have good noses. I have to say, as a human, having smelled some bad smells in my life, I'm so glad I don't smell any better. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that would be the worst superpower. Let's think, just own that right now. If you were Mar in the Marvel universe or DC. I'm not here to, you know, start a Marvel DC fight, but if you were in either universe, right, how, you know, how would it be to have a sniffing power? I think humans primarily use our sense of smell for flavor. Yeah, I, I, and I like that. I don't want to know any more a, about anything that I'm doing. We gather nothing from our environment based on taste. <laughs> Yeah, we don't want to do it. It's a good time to change water. Like I'm looking and my water's looking a little murky. So I'm going to go ahead and get a fresh cup. Whee! And put it over here. Occasionally you'll meet a mechanic that has an inappropriate use of taste in this job. And mechanics know what I'm talking about here. They're not supposed to do it, but they do it anyway all the time. Because you can taste a whole bunch of chemicals that what? just... What? Like antifreeze, for example. But that is poison. I, You know how many times I've seen a mechanic just pick something up and lick it and go, oh, yeah, it's leaked this. Oh, my gosh. I mechanics. know. Mechanics. Don't do just, that with your paint. Get your paint know. out of your mouth. And they're all and like a bunch of people are like, yep, yep. I'm going to take a little <laughs> bit of this blue green. I made some of my uh, ultramarine blue and uh, my phthalo green. I'm coming in and adding some of this interesting little blue green because, you know. Still water. <laughs> so how does a color smell? Well, if you have uh, synesthesia, then uh, you would be able to answer that because those, there are people who can smell colors and see smells and sounds and things. They, they mix that up. We did an exercise uh, once when we were doing one of the life books mm -hmm. uh, where we kind of gave you an experience of like where you would draw or paint what you heard. Remember that project? Mm -hmm. That's kind of cool project. I wonder if it's like anything else where you can like train your brain. To connect those things because it's, you know, they're all neurons inside your head just connected to different sensors. I mean, I, I would think you would have to be able to. To train the brain. To yeah. I, see, I, to see stuff. If you could, I mean, well, meditation be, maybe? I don't know. I'm going to continue with this blue and I'm just really trying to ripple this around. I'm leaving open spaces just so we can see the painting we're doing. It's a little dark, and in the areas where it's dark, you know, it can be a little hard in the filming for you guys to catch what I'm doing. So I definitely, definitely want to make sure that you guys are seeing a bit of what's going on. Hmm. 
pulling that in there, right? As we do. As you do. As we do. We've got some brown in there. I want some brown and yellow in there as well. I'm making a yellow ochre almost. And you're Much just, like everywhere else, we're going to whittle it. You're making some muddled reflection water. Yeah, I'm making some like, it's a shadow under him for sure. Just trying to get a cleaner uh, version of the yellow and brown there. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, we just kind of take that around. There is there is a point to it, right? Like you've got to you realize that over here is more in shadow and over here is more in light. Where it's more in light, mm -hmm. more of what's going on will be reflected. Add a little white to that color, come back and, you know, add maybe more reflections. This one is just a built up one. You just got to build this one up. And then we're going to be doing some blue and white reflections. So these are just some little bits out here that remind us that there's more colors going on. There's a lot of colors. And that's one of the things I always liked is that you always talked about just it's okay to just to put paint from like one part of the canvas anywhere else on the other canvas. It's not only good, it's a great idea to do it. Because it helps like tie together the image. Yeah, it, it pulls a like creative cohesiveness to a particular piece. So if you like pull color from one area to another and there's a bit of balance, like if there was just a spot of red over here, that's all your eye would see. Your eye would be going red, red. Red, red, red. <laughs> and you'd be like, what? Shh. And your eye would be like, never, because there's red right there and only there. Look at it. Very important uh, evolutionary thing for your brain to be able to hmm. identify that, which is weird because it goes lion, 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 <laughs> lion, lion. It's a good thing your brain does it. Good skill. Good skill if you live with lions, which I'm so grateful I don't. I was just thinking today, watching a thing about how lions go crazy during the dark phase of a moon and they just attack everything. Oh, yeah. No. And I, I said to John, I'm like, can you believe like there was a time when like people live with them? This I is right up there with my shark theory. Like, just no. It's just, nope. Nope, nope, nope. All right. I'm going to take the blue and white. We're going to make quite a light, nice reflection that's distinctly blue. This really won't come all the way into play until... We do the white outlining. Because each of these little blue reflections will get like a little white outline. Which we will do much later. Maybe not like the little slivers, but the big distinctive ones. Mm -hmm. So this little blue pop here helps us see the water in uh, another level of its active ripple. And I really like it because there's a bit of a, no puzzle building area to it. I like how the, again, it's the, you have to get those deep parts in there before you can put the highlights, but the highlights are what the eye sees moving. So all the motion is like, the depth is implied with the shadows and the motion is implied in the highlights. And it really just comes together when it comes together, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. These are little touches. You know, I am changing up the directions depending on how the little bear is moving the water, which I really, really love. Sometimes you can get a little more in your thalo blue if you want in some. So there's still reflections, but maybe they're a little more thalo. I'm using my number four round still. And I'm using the number four round because it lets me... Um, and I do these weird little pieces. You 
you know, you do little touches like that. You can be thoughtful. It takes a little bit longer. And that's one of the reasons why a program like this, and, and if you, again, you just found the bear, you didn't know that you fell into a 30 day painting program that was free <laughs> online. And you were just like, I just want to paint a bear. I don't know why I'm paying for 30 days. But if you are doing this and you're working on those water skills, this is one that's going to change uh, a lot. This will change how you paint pools. This will change how you paint. That was one of the things that I felt like we should have done. In uh, we didn't do this year, uh, we did landscape water, but I didn't do any pools. And that's okay, because after acrylic uh, April, I'll probably do a bunch of like lessons that have pools in them. Yeah. So we can take this skill and maybe apply it to some clear pool water. Because that's what you've been living for your whole life, right? <laughs> Waiting to get this to some pool water. Well, that bear, if it give, given an option, would probably be hanging out in the hot tubs and the pools. Well, given the problems that uh, uh, Lake Arrowhead residents have with bears, uh, for a fact, bears will get in your hot tub. <laughs> because you have to call specialty animal control to get bears out of your hot tub. Because the bear's like, it's a hot tub. I'm not getting out. I love my dad because my dad, you know, he's from Rollins, Wyoming, and he grew up really where wildlife was very adjacent to people. <laughs> and his whole position is, it's the bear's hot tub now. Just doesn't belong to us anymore. He took it. And until he decides to give it back, it is his. What are you going to go do? Move the bear? That's right. That's how I feel about this situation. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> My dad's always surprised by, like, regular people in California who are like, yeah, I want to move the bear. <laughs> it's like, good luck moving your bear. Hey, it's good to have a dream. So they have, they have a group of people that uh, relocate the bears. Yeah. No, it's actually, there's Rangers. a... I was watching it. They have very effective and, you know, they're they're somewhat humorous. But only from the perspective of I'm an, a five to eight hundred pound bear, right? Right. Because <laughs> it's like <laughs> bears mildly annoyed. It's like that YouTube channel we were watching with Spider last night, the animal one, where he's like, "I'm a viper, one of the most dangerous animals in the world, black mamba," and this <laughs> mongoose is just <laughs> ruining my day. I'm in a tree and poisonous, <laughs> and I still can't catch a break. Right, mongoose are aggressive snake eaters. Yeah, no, well, they, they pet. They're, they're aggressive eaters of everything. That's the problem. Is they're aggressive eaters of everything. Yep. So ecologically, they're a danger to many, many different environments, and you really don't want to port them in to manage a snake problem. Nope. As many islands have found. Yeah. They're like, we got this snake problem now. We got this okay. long goose problem. I have to share with you the crazy thing. We're still okay. doing dots. What, what we doing? do here on this show is we do dots of blue and white water here, and I can do that. I have, but I have to share this tell with them, you. Tell them what you're doing. So there's these parrots, and, and they're called uh, kias, and they're like in New Zealand, and they're like awesome, and they're like the second smartest, maybe smartest bird in the world. Turns out they also eat and hunt sheep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that just cracked me up. Probably not funny to the sheep or the sheep people. Who, like, looked at him like, did that parrot just eat my sheep? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, my bad sheep experience, so it was like revenge for me. <laughs> you were at one with the sheep. I, I, I certainly related to their experience. Okay. So, guys, we just did some middle ground water. Wasn't that fun? It was. I, I enjoyed chatting with you. I enjoyed chatting with you as well. And when we come back, we'll do this foreground water. And then come back and do the white line. Right. Doesn't that sound fun? Mm -hmm. Let's do it. So this is more of our foreground water. The reflections are a little bit bigger. The rolls on this are a little bit bigger, and we get to really sort of enjoy that. I'm still going to stay on my number four round just for the control that I might have. I'll come over here and get some of the blue and white and brown mix going for some interesting uh, little highlight reflections. I'm going to bring these across here. You see it just kind of travels across there in a very broken line. Break the line. Break the line. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you do. you got to break the line. 
And these sort of imply maybe stuff that's around the bear, clouds, other things. Just let's call these other things. All right. These are other things. Stuff in the environment. Stuff in the environment that is reflecting in the water, so you've got to have it. It's an important part of that. Back into this. A little bit lighter, though, this time. Okay, keep building up the... Building it up. It. And we'll bring some interesting little shapes into it. Because waves are like that. Sometimes around places like this, you'll want to do kind of more of a broken little way that's coming through oh, there. That's looking good. Could be good. Could be okay. Now, along here, I will definitely kind of imply this space. Mm hmm. I wanted a little more blue than I just did it there, but it's okay to come back and uh, add some blue paint in. So you can see that kind of starts to create a wave or a roll. Yeah. That's a foot. If you need to come back with green or anything, like right now, like mine is really good, but you can always come back and do more water, but I like what I have here. Now, I'm going to use my golden uh, fluid acrylic, which is just titanium white in a different polymer of a uh, binder. Mm -hmm. uh, so whereas this is stiff and dries like it is, this is more self-leveling and is more fluid and flows easier. And I'm going to grab a brush, if I can find it, called a number one monogram liner. Just put it away a little bit ago, so I know it's here. There it is. <laughs> I know it's here. This is it. Um, just any detail brush that you have that will treat you well. That's all you want. And we're going to come here. Ah, put some highlights on them. They weirdly have like a, and it, uh, it's a little bright. I might want the highlight to be, say, a little, not quite fully white. White pulls it too close to my face. Mm. Uh, everything in your surface um, is either pulling or pushing stuff back, and we do absolutely want to have this show up, but we also don't want it so bright it leaves the surface. I like all the little highlights. Again, I think that, that they bring the most motion to it. Mm hmm Now you're like, oh, is this that white lining thing you do with the clouds? No, this is not this. This is actually a reflection that on this type of water you have to capture. Hmm. I didn't know that. Although there's a lot of things I didn't know. Because the way the ripple is, like, it'll it'll convex out, I guess, I, the reflections. You could fill a 30-day painting series with stuff i didn't know really i should do that we'll call it acrylic april huh. teach art for free every day for 30 days i imagine something like that might help a couple people you never know but we won't it, know until we try but they'll have to leave us messages to tell us was this a good idea let's mm. find out If you also watch the Bears Eat Salmon and you know who Otis is, please leave a comment down below. I want all the, I want all the Otis fans to please stand up. I did that, yes. You kind of heard it there. <laughs> <laughs> it happened. It wasn't a hallucination. Just a couple little reflections, like maybe out in that one. Now, believe it or not, we're going to be in the busy, busy work. Hmm. Let's get down to it of all of these. Oh, 
whoa, there's some serious highlighting there. Yeah, it's a bit of a thing. And not always the easiest, but. It's hard to make sure I'm staying focused on it, too. It really is. And I'm just on the toe of my brush, and I'm using my fluid paint. If you don't have fluid paint, you can get bottled craft paints the same consistency. Or you can just thin your heavy body paint with water until it's thin enough to do. The reason that I don't is that there's more pigment, titanium white pigment, in this paint considerably. Hmm. That's interesting. That's starting to make those, like, happen. If it makes you happy, can't be that bad. I love them. And you're saving the pure white? Yeah, the pure white um, will be used very sparingly in the painting. This is probably one of the lighter reflections that we're going to do. We'll do a long reflection after we get the hair into the water. We'll do a reflection over here and a little bit of one over here. And definitely one up by the nose. But I want, I want the bear to be painted in before I put in that last water reflection. And you tend to save that that's super white for the same reason you said that you use the, uh, like, don't use red just once because it yeah. super draws the attention of the eye. Yeah. If I, if I, it's going, the greatest area of contrast in your work tends to become the focus of the painting. So that's why you want to think about it. If you're not trying to make this the focus of the painting, mm -hmm. then maybe you got to be a little careful there. That's kind of fun, isn't it? Yeah. Now, like right now, like without the bear in, <laughs> it's just like kind of a really cool abstract painting right now without the bear in. It's like the negative space bear. Phantom bear. Pretty cool. It is pretty cool. Similar stuff happens out in the ocean, just different color schemes. That's the only difference. You just get some different color schemes going on. You can be as meticulous about this as you want. You can also be just kind of like, generally, there's some groovy stuff afoot. It's really, really up to you. Mm-hmm. And also use this time to create some little French ripples in the water. French ripples are just where they're rapidly ri like rippling close waves together. So there might be some there. I'm definitely going to maybe. Think of some going on there. And we'll get into some even wider ones there. That'll be kind of fun. Put a little little bit behind him. Yeah. A little bit. Just a little bit. A Helps little tie little the environment together. Me. Keeps it real. Keep your bear real. Keep him grounded. But it does, you know, maybe in the distance it wouldn't be as focal, but these are things that you would see up close and, and you want to kind of capture them if you can. Right. All right. That's that step. After this, we got to get on to the bear, the, bear, the bad news bears, the business of the bear, the bear business. Mm. So we'll come back and we'll paint some bears and talk about fur and talk about wet fur and it'll be fun. So now we get to paint the bear and some of the things that you want to look at, the reason I like to paint the water is there's so much energy and there's so much activity going on around him. And I feel like when I'm thinking of you guys at home, I try to sometimes break things down in step order based on your experience. Not necessarily like you have to do it this way though, because we're going to be putting little fine bits of fur kind of out and over him, it's nice to have the water resolved. And I probably would, have at least resolved most of this water 
before beginning him just so I can have a lot of delicate edge on the fur mm. would be something that I would do. So if you're wondering like why this order, why this way? The other thing is, is that when I put him in, I can see like, am I happy with the value of everything? Like, do I want to come in here? I might lighten some value up in this front water in between some reflections or, you know, or is it exactly dialed in where I want it? So that's another thing, but you don't really get a sense of that to paint him in. Now to paint him in, I am going to be using my hog brushes to paint him in. This is a number eight Cambridge and this is a number six Cambridge round, bright and round. You don't have to have this brand of brush. Um, there are a lot of brands like Simply Simmons makes a chunking hog. A lot of companies make a hog brush. You want a good one that's not shedding on you, that's well crammed. And, and it has that word chunking in it, which is just like how it spells, just like how it sounds. And mm. that just means that the hog bristles are not crazy. <laughs> For this part, I'm going to take the number eight bright and I'm going to do what's called, I'm going to block him in again by value. I'm going to pick some different zones in him, go mostly dark value so I can build up the fur, but also I want to pay attention to like, is this area a little bit lighter than maybe another area? So I will be doing some of that as well. To begin, I will start with a little brown and black. And you can see this brush is uh, quite scruffy. Scruffy brush. Uh, we'll be coming back along here. A little bit, creating little details along the edge. To make sure that this feels like a water's edge. Hopefully as we get him in. Now this helps make the fur texture. Yeah, I like this because it does. It does help me improve the fur texture. Just you can see already that that brush just kind of wants to do fur. The ears I've got to put back. I painted out a lot of my ear. So I have to kind of think about where my ear is again. So brush directionality is important at this point? With fur, brush directionality is everything. The direction that you're stroking your brush should be in the direction of the fur. So if the fur is growing kind of out and down, you're going to want to mimic that with your brush strokes. It's not just value. It's also texture and the directionality of a brush. Here in a second. Now I'll be coming back with the round and then eventually detail. Mm -hmm. But this just gives us a very good beginning. I don't go deep into the water. I just want to connect the bear to the water's edge. And then we'll be doing a little detail row of, of along his edge where the fur and the water connect. Right. So that'll be another nice thing that makes it feel kind of like water. And you can see I'm still sort of thinking about that. As I come up here, I may go more into the a browner brown. I think about what color is the shadow under the fur. And if I know I'm going to be like, you know, maybe in more golds, then maybe. Get some more yellow here and come across. You can see I am thinking about the directionality of the brush stroke. Mm -hmm. And that is important. Coming here with the black. Kind of under his little eye a bit. This is a little darker over on this side. I won't paint the eye out completely because I want to be able to get it in there. Mm. And it's okay that some of the green is showing through. By the time he's built up, 
He will be so built up that it won't even. You won't even see it. Not even at all. Just a little more black around this eye. Now, his nose is sort of an interesting uh, thing because the front up here is black and blue, kind of with a little kind of undertones of reds every once in a while. Uh, but it's kind of gold and gray there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of my brown and my black and my yellow. Maybe more black. Oh, there's his nose. You know, I can always get a little red into it. And it coming down. A nice undertone for the fur that's there. Sound pretty good. I'll take this out and let's do a number four round just to sort of have a little more control over what's going on in the nose. And I will use the ultramarine blue and the Mars black to do the basis of the nose. We're going to just get the shape in. Mm. It's interesting, the dark, dark blue you're using. Yeah, I like this for noses. It gives it more, like, organic. I feel like uh, on on his skin, you can see these undercolors, right? So you see, like, the pink under there, and you see a little blue under there. And I feel like when you can capture that, that's always a good thing. I'm going to grab some of this and just make sure that the shaping around the nose feels correct. Add a little bit here, making sure that, that the shaping and shading around the eye feels correct. Uh. Before you can do that, you can give him a little bit of thought. I'm not going to put in the black because I want to paint up a lot of his nose before I get the black in. Right. I'll, I'll darken all this, but I want to leave these nostrils where I can see them. And I will go ahead and... put what could be an eye. Later we'll make it like an eye, but we just want to know where that is. All right. So there we go. Ooh. Let's call that a step. And I will see you right back here. So when you're doing fur, it is important kind of this the order in which you paint things really mostly because the way it layers over. And so there's this back area on the bear, I'm going to call that the crown, where his ears and the furthest ridge of fur is. So if I want to paint him well in that and start putting those highlights, I'm really, really going to want to um, start there. I'm going to use my number six round because it gives me a bit of control, but it's still nice and scruffy and will continue that fur feeling. Mm -hmm. And I'll be looking at the overall values. Like if you look at his ears, they've got kind of a, a burnt sienna and Mars black kind of feel with some taupey uh, guard hairs. But then as it comes forward, he goes much more blonde. So I'm going to play with those ideas as I go forward. I'm going to take a little Mars black. Maybe even a little more Mars black. You'll see me painting with this. I'm on the toe of my number six. And I will even kind of talk about the hair on him a bit. The other thing that's kind of fun is you can kind of clump it some. Hmm. And you can because he got wet. So the fur will clump. Oh. 
I have a lot of videos on fur, but this would probably substitute for all those. So if you wanted to paint your own bear that was perhaps a slightly different color or a different fur texture, you could go to your video on fur and find them? You could do that. Let's come over here. We want to kind of do uh, some similar things in both areas. Um, so I'm going to go back and forth between the two. I will be careful about how much I wet my brush here because hog bristles can absorb so much water. Hmm. That's just something to think about. As we come to these outer edges, right, if I pull this over here and get a little white into it, he, he does have a bit of a topi. value and thought to his hair. So I mm -hmm. want to try to capture that topiness. Not dopey, he's topi. Mm -hmm. I'll leave the inside of the ear darker. And that will help imply that there is an interior of the ear. Let's add some of this taupe here. Onto these outer edges again, leaving that inner ear shaded a little bit. A little bit. Now I can come into my yellow and my burnt sienna. Get that blonder hair. Perhaps on the edge out here on this outer edge of this ear. Not a fun little touch. Mm -hmm. Coming up here. Just playing with those things. Just creating a little balance in the fur. Balance in the fur. Well, you know. This ear and that ear might have similar stuff going on. No, they can they can be a little different, but you don't want to be like so, like well, and it could be completely different, but that would identify a very specific bear. I guess so. If the fur was completely different on two ears, you would probably be thinking, "Well, this is a very specific bear that I have seen." <laughs> so, if you're not trying to create a very specific bear, you may want to not do that as much. I'm taking a little of my brown and my red and my yellow. Good. Adding some of this uh, kind of redder fur to the mix. A couple spots here. And uh, come here and Highlight it. And the outside edge, just so I have a better angle on that highlight. So I love fur because it can be actually quite colorful. My uh, very favorite Southwest painters tend to do very, very colorful fur. I thought blue, they have all kinds of green. <laughs> all the colors will be in the fur. So come back to this backwards crown. I'm going to definitely get again a little into the red and yellow. Getting more of a blonde hair and put some bird sienna in it. It's still kind of brown fur. Get some white in there. Playing with the colors. It's important to leave the dark values underneath. Cause that's what helps it uh, feel a little bit like fur because fur has so many values. Mm. Oh. <laughs> Isn't he cute? He really is. He's so cute. Come forward here. 
on fur. Now he's got this little fur that comes in front of the ear and you can kind of see why we might want to do the ear first because that's what pushes the ear back. Mm -hmm. And his little crown of fur starts to happen. Get a little actual just brown over here. Yeah. Maybe brown and black were just kind of uh the fur kind of comes out into the water. And I'll do it over here as well. It's a little clumpier. Some black and brown, won't be the fur. Rinse out if I have too much of another color on there, rinse out. about the layers of the fur at this point it is all about the layers and just knowing where your layers are going to be like i know i've got a wonderful run of light taupe fur that's going to come up over here but it will only do that if i get my layers into my fur here so i'll take my black and i'm creating kind of a shadow in this range just trying to help the fur feel like it got a little bit wet mm -hmm. and matted Do the same over here. A little bit wet and matted. I'm also going to come up through here. A bit of a dark, dark fur. Even darker than what I have here. Mm -hmm. Because we've got to part his hair. Some of it starts to go this. The directionality of fur growth is very important. You can see I'm curving. As I curve over here towards the left, those brush strokes start to curve over to the left. And as I curve over to the right, those brush strokes start to curve over to the right. Start thinking about my blonder hair. Starting to pick up a little more sunlight. Well, and and it 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 does tend to be like almost bleached out. I drew I just dried off my brush, and the reason I dried off my brush is I don't want it to be so you're constantly battling like the two zones of like, do I want to have it have a lot of moisture right now? You know, how do I want it to be? Coming down with a little bit of red, trying to talk about maybe clumped together hair. Mm. Is that fun? I like it. Makes me happy. It does make me happy. Bear makes me happy too. He's just he's he's just barren. Like that's his thought. He's like, I'm just barren. You just do you. I'm just gonna bear here and you uh take my picture. But I'm just barren. Yep. I could get up and move you, but <laughs> he's like, I'm tired. I'm not gonna do that. Because I'm a bear. I get to choose. Why would I do that when I can sit here and eat fish? I will do that. Get you later, camper. Hey, 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 it's Yogi Bear. Right. You can see we're just kind of following that directionality, building up that value. 
I need a lighter value. Come in on the toe of the brush with, with even more. This bear is going to be one of the favorite things you paint all month. I'm telling you, this is going to be like the splashy dog <laughs> from 2020. I really like this. I like it too very much. And my cad yellow over to my cad red. More to the blonde. I've got some white there so I can get that kind of. Now, what I'm trying to do here is make sure that even as I'm adding um, these little marks, mm -hmm. and you could do this with a round brush, you could do this with any brush, but I'm just trying to make sure that I shorten the brush strokes and I leave more of it a little dark right here. That's what I'm trying to do. You got to build up uh, bare hair in layers. Yeah. Especially when they're wet because they clump, the hair clumps and really shows the undercoat. <laughs> undercoat. Things you didn't know about bears. Now you do. Now you do. I'm going to leave lots of uh, kind of dark values there. Mm-hmm. And that's how the hair is going to look like it's wet because it's clumped together, giving a distinguished kind of value. I can always come back with a lighter value. Be very, very sun bleached hair. Okay. So very, very sun bleached hair. I enjoy that. I like the sound of the brush on the canvas. Yeah. Makes me super happy. It's just a very good pair. If I like want to put a lighter value where I saw in the ears, that's why I sometimes come back into the ears and be like, oh, you could use a lighter value there. Maybe you would have one. I don't get my brush too wet because I, I need to be able to do a dry brushing. The dry brushing really, really helps. Mm -hmm. And come forward into a little more of the yellow and red, orange mm -hmm. kind of hair coming here. And these brush strokes are much shorter. They kind of imply. Maybe a, a shorter hair. Mm. Let's put a little color through. Air and water. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's he's barren. <laughs> barren the bear. Okay, all right. Looking so good. Let's call that a step because then we'll move forward into more of the focal features of the face, and that gives you a chance to kind of catch up. It's really the same mixes and everything uh, coming forward, but it's a good idea to sometimes break up this stuff so you guys don't get overwhelmed within each step. Mm. So I will see you back here in a second. So at this stage, I'm going to want to go in and kind of detail some eyes so I can pull fur around the eyes and kind of layer it in here. We've got this sort of inner inner part of the bear. If you 
not really seen this before, you're suddenly realizing, oh, that's why petty bears are constructed the way that they are. Hmm. It's kind of interesting whenever you're painting anything because you can really get a sense for it. I'm going to take my number four round. And I'm going to come in and get some of my red and brown together that just really get them kind of glowing. And we'll come in into this eye here. And just add a little bit of a space that maybe perhaps has some light and kind of catching it. And there's a bit here as well. It's really not tremendously a lot on this piece. Mm -hmm. Your eyes are kind of, you know, definitely darker. And so I'm not trying to, you know, necessarily paint uh, like a very luminous eye like we do on some creatures. But it's nice to get some of that uh, color in there. Yeah. Just to say that we have it. And you don't want it so big that um, it pulls attention away from the eye. Also, coming around their eye, there's kind of some dark skin, so I will do some of my gray, my blue, my ultramarine blue, my Mars black, and just a smidge of white. Kind of like what we had on the nose. A little bit like what we had on the nose. That's where the skin is. I'll bring that around here. It's definitely, you know, a darker space over here. But this will help us make sure that our bear, and I'm going to tip mine up to make sure I'm seeing it correctly, looks right. Well, you know, and I can let that have a bit of a second, having a little bit of a dry. It won't hit its little highlights quite yet. But I can use this color right here. Maybe even with a, a little white in it. Mm -hmm. Just to lighten it up. I want my brush to be quite dry. So what you see me doing is trying to make sure that my brush doesn't have a lot of moisture in it. For a hog brush to work well uh, in this type of technique, you don't want it to have a ton of moisture. He's got almost like a little bald spot. I guess where the fish have said, no! <laughs> fish have said, no, you cannot eat me. The bear said, oh, I'm eating you. Why you think you're not getting eaten, but you're getting eaten. And the fish, I don't want to be eaten. I'm going to swim. Swim in my belly. And that's what the bear said, swim in my belly. Yeah, it's so weird because, like, bears eat all kinds of things, and I don't find that disturbing. But I think about the Kia parrot eating a sheep. I find that super disturbing. <laughs> Isn't it weird how context changes everything? Yeah, I guess so. I'm going to, again, get into my yellow color which is my cad uh red and yellow and, and a little brown helps you see the velociraptor and the birds <laughs> we certainly do see the velociraptor and the birds don't we a little more brown as i come around A little more brown as it come around. Bump it a little bit as well. Bumps a little into the water. Clumpy clumps. Mm. This is, I'm going to clumpy clump, clump, clump. Clumpy clumps. That's right. It all brings, brings it in. A 
come into the light fur color. I need to add just enough water to improve flow. I will, but I am very careful with it. I'm picking up. Kind of an interesting thing because I'll be just very light here, very dry brushy. And I'm applying just, a, just such a short hair, right? Where his nose has gotten rubbed off. Mm -hmm. Well, not his whole nose, just some skin, some fur on his nose. He was, it may be the spot that he's scritching. He's yeah, scritched. Scratchy place. He had a scritchy place. And it caused that. Just kind of dry brush that there. And he's got nice little darker brown sort of stuff. So I'm going to grab my black and brown again. I'm going to come here. Is that glazing a little bit? It may be. I might have a little bit extra water on my, um, let me see. Yeah, a little. It just also brown is very transparent. And that's okay. So that that's it, okay. it builds that up. We're building up anyways. And so as we build up, it's going to cover. And we've got plenty of time. I just want to make sure that we build up his little fur. Pulling that all in a little more yellow. Might keep highlighting over here, just kind of around this part. Making sure that's a little highlighted. It's not like a grape spot, but it is a little bit balded, right? Yeah. Wow. He's really starting to come into focus. He's a focus bear. <laughs> well, it, it's it's interesting because uh, the different layers, you see different elements of the bear as he comes to be. And there we go. Pulling in his little fur. So he looks pretty furry. Yeah, I'd say. He's, he's got some fur. He's got some stuff going on. I very it's, much like what's happening around, you know, his eyes and stuff. I might make it a little bigger over here just so when I come in and paint in a second over here. I've got a little more room in that space. I'm going to dry my canvas because I just wanted to darken that. Well, I guess I, can, I might paint while it dries. I'll paint while it dries. <laughs> Sometimes I do that. I'm like, I pay why it dries. I can get my red into brown. If you remember, you can create another kind of uh, brown fur color. Put his other eye in a little bit. Yeah. And I just want to, I think I do, I want to dry my brush out. I just got to make sure that it's not carrying extra moisture. You, 
the more you paint with the hog, the more it'll carry extra moisture. So it's just, you've got to have that towel. You've got to have that towel. Hold on a second. So let's finish up some furs around here. He's got some fur. Get my cad uh, yellow back over to my cad red and a little of my brown. I love, I love this blonde kind of orange fur that he's got going on. Fun to paint. Super fun to paint. Now over here, his fur is a lot darker under the eye. Mm -hmm. A little more in sh shadow. So this is like maybe like a little pop of highlight. And we might be highlighting this. And a little bit around his nose there. But then we get back into the brown and black fur. The slightly darker fur. And I'll turn it if I need to. I'm still keeping the directionality going. Mm, I see. Mm, you see? I do. It makes him, you know, the directionality of the fur continues to make it look like fur. Otherwise, he'd have a little, you know, little sprig of hair going flying. It he would. He would have a little sprig of hair going flying. But this side's a little darker, and I, and I really want to make sure that I kind of capture that that it is. But even as I go through and paint his fur, I'm, I am thinking about how it is darker over here. We'll still paint little clumps. And maybe there'll still be little bits of highlight. But it's more in shadow. And even when I come here to the side of his muzzle fur, mm -hmm. I do need to think about how that shadow is there. Coming up over his eye, though, I can get a little lighter, which will help shape what's going on. And a little bit of light might capture right there and right here. Okay. We've got his nose and his eyes left. Mm -hmm. So let's do a step that's nose and eyes, and okay. then we'll finish with the glisten. Because it's its own experience, the glisten. So we're going to finish up his little nose and eyes. I'm going to use a number four round. Uh, I might get myself some fresh water at this point because, again, getting a little murky. I will take my cad yellow and my cad red. Get kind of a nice orange going over here. Touch just inside the eye a bit. And again, it's not big. It's not a. It's not a huge thing. It just is a nice thing to add in there. The other nice thing that I can add in, um, if I want, is I can take a little of my blonde color that we had for his fur. And add some little eyelashes, as you do. Mm. Theirs have lovely lashes. <laughs> Very lovely. Very little known fact about them is their lovely, lovely lashes. But I'm going to get into his nose, which is going to be a combo of my uh, ultramarine blue and my Mars black, and then also um, a little bit into my brown. Let's start the nostril. Give a really specific shaped nostril. 
Kind of like a tadpole almost. It's so weird. They got the good sniffer. They got the good sniffer. Their sniffer has a job. And it do that job. So I want to try to capture that, um, you know, correct shape. But I also recognize that I'm just taking my black and my blue here. That uh, I've got to, um, you know, paint what I see. That makes sense. Got to paint what you see. It's the only way to get through it. No, so if I'm adding the little shadow over here, that makes sense because he's much more in shadow on that right side. Even if I come forward into my brown and black and say make an even, you know, almost lighter color. Kind of coming at the top. A bit of a top color here. Add white when I want to lighten it. Bring it down here. The nose structure of a bear is is a really busy bit of kit. I just mm -hmm. can't even explain how busy it is. Nose comes up here and kind of dips in. We don't see the dip on this side, but it is implied. I can see that. And capture the shape and then add the highlights. There's this interesting little highlight on the inside edge. And capture his little nose. Such a weird structure. Mm. Bear nose is a weird structure. You have a weird structure. It's okay if I get a little red into it. Again, there's that weird cast. A bit on his inside nostril there. Alright. Capturing the little shadows and highlights. So there might be a little of this uh, sort of blue-gray highlight up top mm -hmm. on the nose. And it is almost a highlight. Right there. Bear nose. Very busy, busy bear nose. Mm. A little highlight down. A little highlight over. And then one right there. And perhaps one right there. Trying to capture all those little shapes and shadows and things that are going on. It's a lot going on. There's a lot happening in his nose, man. It's a busy, busy nose. Sometimes I'll change uh, my point of view mm -hmm. and ch turn my canvas. You can stand up and kind of stand away from your bare nose if you need to. You'll get a little distance from a distance. And see the bear nose better. 
bring a deeper shadow over here. I'm into that. It's it's like so fascinating trying to capture them. Like, oh, I gotta just, get it. If I get that there, then I gotta put a little highlight right there. I'm just trying to see how the nose is built mm. and make sure that his little nose feels like the real nose that he has. Yeah. But like everything else on anything, it's it's really all about. Catching highlights and shadows and things. I'm going to get kind of like a blue-gray reflection, and I'm going to start. This is the beginning of it. It isn't the glisten. The glisten is coming. But this is the place by which the glisten even could exist. That little highlight under his nose. Yeah. Very important little highlight under his nose. Little highlight under the eye there. No, this isn't the glisten. The glisten is coming, but we can't get to the glisten until we get that amount in. Now, when you come back, I'm going to show you the corridor of light and the bear being all glisteny wet. And then we'll be done. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of highlight my water and also create the effect of his fur being like super, super wet. And there's a couple little tricks to that. But first, let's get into a water. I'm going to take my ultramarine and my uh, thalo, uh, my ultramarine and my thalo green, get some white into it. And I want just a slightly dark, you know, not so light that my highlights go away, but a bit of a... Highlight kind of coming down. So there's almost a corridor of light. And I like to do this at this stage so that you can kind of see what you've got and what you might be changing as you go. Mm -hmm. Getting that teal. So that's the ultramarine. not a big thing we are kind of coming down here and saying oh a thing happened let me come back and put that in a little more mm -hmm. considered I'm still leaving some of my shadow there I'm just adding that highlight you can even get a little more into this Okay, so we've at, we've added a little bit of highlight through the water. Yeah. Right. Now we're going to get into our fluid, and there's a lot to do. We're going to add lots of little sparkles. You kind of did this in a few of the previous paintings. Mm-hmm. The idea that the water has some sparkles coming down it. It's a little bit of a touch of thing. And as you can see already, it makes that a pretty big difference. Oh man, it does. Right. You're going to... I'm here. Up, up a few little sparkly bits there on the nose. There's a bit right here, but really about here. And 
And then we've got some really weird kind of things to do. We're going to come and I think I'll take my black. I'm going to come along my fur at first, along this edge, taking my black. And I'm going to shade under his fur there. Just for a second, right? So now it's sort of shaded there. We've got the sparkling coming. I'm going to grab my fluid white again. Now I'm going to go some other places because I've got to let this dry for a second. We're going to put some glistening on his fur. So what happens is, is when, when stuff is wet, it does catch the light and almost sparkle. Mm. And if you're trying to say that something is, uh, is very, very wet, you're going to want to capture that a few places. Whether it's a girl in a wetsuit or a bear <laughs> in the water. And honestly, this is a similar thing that we do with, like when we paint bugs, right? Yeah. We add the like bright reflections and uh, show that it's, and if it gets too big, I just come back with a little bit of my ultramarine blue. And I can lift it back. Mm, maybe actually pull that one up. You got to keep it kind of small. And I think I got a little big there. And that'll happen. Sometimes you get a little big. Sometimes you get a little much. That's okay. I like to also put some of these. And a few hairs like up on the ears, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Now, if he's been sitting here a very long time, some of him may have dried out. That's true. So by sharing this little part, You really are showing how he you really are. You do. You kind of help him feel a little wetter. Isn't he just spectacular? Mm -hmm. You want to also run a little bit of this. A few places along that water's edge that you just created the shadow for. Along his little nose. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you're starting to understand water a little bit more. Yeah, I like I liked the glistening part. Now on this side, I will have the glisten be just a little blue. It's still over here, but it's just a little blue. It says the glistens a little bit in the shadow. It does say that just a bit. It's still here. Mm -hmm. Still happened. Still going along the water line. Mm -hmm. But not quite as. Well.
I'll switch back to my bright white. The glistening really does it. It does, doesn't it? It's like, hi, I'm the bear. Look at my I'm a little bit wet. Don't be disturbed. Keep doing my little thing. Mm -hmm. And these are just little bits of little bits of ooh, water sparkling. Sparkling, sparkling. It's almost there. Water. I think we're there. Wow. I think we're getting there. I feel good about this. I like it. I feel like you guys learned some stuff. So like the little spots of water, all that, that's like a little drop that's maybe reflecting the sun, the way that he's sort of here. Hopefully this feels like, whoa, I want to paint everything in a pool now. <laughs> that would be my goal or my wish for you. I got to find my one, number one monogram liner. Now, as I sign, I am going to want to sign. I just don't want it to take over the whole painting. So I'm going to use my blue and white and fluid paint and my monogram liner, and I will come maybe here. But you spent a long time on a painting, and signatures are important, but so is the painting. Yeah. So you don't want to do something that just is like, it's not even your painting anymore. This is how you paint a wet bear in a pond. Now you know that. You didn't know it. Now you know it. Pretty exciting. Uh, tomorrow's going to be kind of a chill landscape, so that'll be really fun. And we'll get kind of into, uh, you know, that green grass, reflective sky, fun stuff. That'll be lovely. Kind of continuing on in the story. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a sort of story in each week. Yeah. Happening. So you kind of get like not only you're learning the skills that are layering, but you're learning the skills that are layering. Uh, you're going to be so good at water by the end of this month. It's going to be amazing. Or maybe you just came in and painted a bear and you're really proud of it. If you loved it, be sure and share it in the Acrylic April the group. Hmm? The bear is so good. I love this bear. <laughs> I love this bear too. Be sure and share this in the Acrylic April group or in the Art Sherpa official group. Either one is fine on Facebook. You can. Share with me on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, if you are doing Acrylic April, be sure and hashtag Acrylic April 2021 so that we can see you and everyone else who's doing it can uh, give you some love and support. I hope you're joining me for the whole journey, but if I just had you for this one painting, thank you so much for your time. Be good to yourself. Be good to each other. And I want to see you at an easel really soon. Bye-bye.